So I was a great blues lover from when I was 12 and my dad bought me my first double album of the great blues singer Bessie Smith. And I remember looking at that album cover and seeing her face and seeing something of my own face in hers. And then after, from about the age of 12, I kind of developed this imaginary extended black jazz family because I grew up in an all-white area in an all-white part of Glasgow, Bishop Briggs in North Glasgow. And I didn't have uh, any teachers that were black. You hardly saw anybody on television that was black. So there was nobody at all, and my mum and dad were both white. And so I found that I took a lot of my identity from jazz musicians. I, I kind of put things together and, and, and pieced myself together. I like this extended black family. I like the idea of it. Yeah, I, I kind of immerse myself in, in music outside of my time. It's interesting, you know, that I think what prompted me to write Trumpet was coming across a tiny little piece in the Guardian newspaper about a jazz musician called Billy Tipton. And it was, it was really a tiny little bit, but I cut it out and it said that Billy Tipton had died and on dying it was discovered that he was a woman and that his three adoptive sons hadn't known that their father was a woman. And one of them in this little article at the end of the article that said, he'll always be daddy to me. And I found that incredibly moving, that it made me think that the identity was about a kind of a belief. If you love somebody enough, you believe them. And so I became quite fascinated in Billy Tipton and I kind of found out everything that I could find out. And then I kind of stopped reading about him because Joss Moody, the character, started to kind of form and I didn't want to, Billy Tipton was, was a white American jazz musician. I wanted to recreate a black Scottish jazz musician and I didn't want it to be too close. I didn't want it to be a kind of biography fueled novel. But yes, that was the initial thing. I just found it extraordinary. With Trumpet, the idea came to me and it had to be a novel. I couldn't think how I could write that in, as a series of, of poems and I couldn't think how I could write it as a play. Um, so it came to me as a novel when I had the idea, but I also was, because uh, I'd been asked to write a novel, I was kind of trying to think novelistically. Um, the, the, the trouble for me is that novel ideas or ideas for novels only come along uh, every so often. I'm, I'm much more likely to have ideas for short stories or for poems or for plays. Trumpet was definitely a novel to me, but it was then a case of, well, how do I write a novel? I haven't written a novel before. How do I structure it? What do I do? I've got the starting off point. I've got the ideas. I've got the characters now. Um, but, but how do I do it? And so that was, the, that was the challenge for me. We go for a drink in Lauder's bar. He tells me his name is Joss Moody. And I ask him if it's his real name. He's offended. I see a look across his face that I haven't seen before. Of course it's his real name. What am I talking about? I tell him it sounds like a stage name, like a name that someone would make up in anticipation of being famous. He laughs at that and tells me he is going to be famous. I laugh too, nervously. I know he's going to be famous also. I could have noticed then, I suppose, the way he was so irritated with me, asking him about his name. I say, my name is Millie McFarlane, as if I'd just heard it for the first time as if my own name was miles away from who I am. I say, Millicent McFarlane, but my friends call me Millie, suddenly shy. We talk about anything. He tells me he plays the trumpet. He's so pleased with himself for playing the trumpet. I can see that. He says the word trumpet and his eyes shine. Would you like one for the road, Millie? He asks. Him saying my name makes me weep. I hold on to the table and watch him go to the bar for his whiskey and my gin. Glasgow appears in the novel in lots of different ways. And I mean, I, I love Glasgow as a city and I grew up in Glasgow and it's a great city to write about in a kind of tangential way um, because, you know, you had a great dancing hall scene in Glasgow. You've got an amazing central station where lots of Highlanders I uh, used to come down and they call it the Healing Man's Umbrella. You've got all these different names for, for parts of Glasgow. And 
in Glasgow just over 100 years ago, Gaelic was spoken more than Glaswegian, so it's a city that's gone through a lot of changes. And it's fascinating to me, endlessly fascinating, to try and find different ways uh, to write about Glasgow. So I wanted to place uh, Joss, Moody and Millie in Glasgow, where they meet. And Millie has a flat in Rose Street, and um, just near where the GFT is, just near the Art College. I quite like the idea of her her living in a steep street like that. I like how hilly Glasgow is, <laughs> how San Francisco Glasgow is. And then all the dance halls in Glasgow, I got information about all of them from my dad, who was a great dancer and who loved going to the dance halls in that time, because obviously the, the novel is set in a town that I, I, I didn't live in. When our cameraman was in the neighborhood, he looked in at the Barrowland dance hall and filmed the Jitterbug contest. So I had to rely on my encyclopedia, walking encyclopedia, my human encyclopedia of a, of a dad to recreate the, the dance halls. It may surprise you to learn that this dance is done in Great Britain. And as a newsreel, we endeavour to present all the pictorial news, and the news includes anything that is unusual. But the Barrowlands and places like that that I also write about in the novel, I did go to um, a lot when, when I was a kid, and I did get a sense of Glasgow is a changing city because so much of it's on the water and because there was the UCS and then the Upper Clyde shipbuilders, that industrial identity that was given to Glasgow that kind of changed, changed and changed into, like if you look at Finiston today, it's practically unrecognisable from the Finiston of the 60s. So I was quite interested in Glasgow as a transformative place when I was writing Trumpet. Trumpet took me five years to write, which I feel a bit embarrassed, you know, um, telling you that because it's not a long novel. I meet people that read Trumpet in six hours and I think, what? You read it in six hours and it took me five years to write? Are you joking? So um, I think really basically I'm not a natural novelist. And, uh, and so when I first started writing Trumpet, I was actually in Cornwall. And I think that the cliffs and the cliff top walk that Millie has was, was influenced by being there. Although when I tried to transport that to Scotland, it was more difficult because we don't really have cliffs in that exact way in the part of Scotland that I wanted to put her in. So that's why some parts of Trumpet are actually made up with a mixture of kind of somewhere like Crivy in the northeast of Scotland, somewhere like Cornwall and somewhere like Pitt and Weem. And I tried to put all of these places together in this made up place that she goes to, which I think was inspired by just walking along those cliffs in Cornwall and, and, and starting to kind of come to terms with, with this book. So it's, I started writing it there. I then went and got a, a six month job as a visiting Josephine Miles professor in Berkeley, uh, California. So I wrote the majority of Trumpet there. And that was quite interesting because I was far away from anywhere that I was really creating. And it made it in some ways easier. I understand writers like, you know, James Baldwin or whoever who, who go to, or James Joyce, who, who go to France or uh, and find the, the distance away from the place that they're um, brought up and actually gives them a clearer sight of it. And so, yeah, the majority of Trumpet was really, really written in those six months, but then I kind of got stuck structurally. And this man called Nick Drake just wrote to me and asked me if I could pick a gay icon to write about uh, for a series that he was doing, and I said, I can't really because I'm writing this novel. And he said, well, but, you know, this, this could take you six months, and, you know, I, I urge you to stop writing your novel and write this other book. So I did, because uh, I was stuck anyway, so I stopped writing Trumpet and wrote Bessie. Go back Bessie Smith, the blues singer, which was a kind of a mixture of memoir and biography. It's a kind of curious format, but I decided to try and write about her life and write about my own life at the same time. So I stopped and wrote that and something about returning to blues and jazz and immersing myself in jazz and blues biographies and in, and in the blues themselves. Uh, something clicked then and then I, might, I was able to finish Trumpet. So I do think of the two books as being twinned and therefore it not being really five years that it took me to write Trumpet because I wrote two books in that period. So when he takes off, he is a whole century galloping to its close the wide moors, the big mouth, Scotland, Africa, slavery, freedom. He is a girl, a man, everything, nothing. He is sickness, health, the sun, the moon, black, white. Nothing weighs him down, not the past or the future. He hangs on to the high sea and then he lets it go, screams, lets it go, bends his notes and bends his body. His whole body is bent over double. 
his trumpet pointing down at the floor, then up to the sky. He plays another high C, he holds on, he just keeps blowing. He is blowing his story. His story is blowing in the wind. He lets it rip. He tears himself apart. He explodes. Then he brings himself back. Slowly, slowly, piecing himself together. The secret to Trumpet was to give the entire book a musical structure and that there needed to be other people telling Joss's story, that he needed to be seen from more points of view than just his wife and his son. And so I started to think of who else would be able to tell this story and how this story would have affected other people. And it became then like a piece of jazz um, with, with solo moments, you know, people appearing and then disappearing like a solo and then returning to the main riff. And then once I got that kind of musical structure, um, it, the book was, was really a joy to, to finish, but it, it was quite a hard time to get that. It didn't just, it just didn't just come to me in the beginning. And I know that there are certain novelists that plan their entire books out before they even start. And I didn't do that. I mean, I did plan certain things, a big wall charts and things, <laughs> and do lots of colouring in to console myself when I couldn't write, you know, just get to the stationery shop. Um, but but I, I, I felt like I have to surprise myself when I write. And if I surprise myself, hopefully, I'll surprise my reader. I was presented with a kind of a problem in writing the novel which was, if Millie's being hounded by journalists all the time in London, then am I going to have the whole book with her being hounded? So I wanted her to go somewhere kind of remote where everybody wasn't reading and obsessed with the papers all, all of the time. Although it maybe stretches a reader's credulity to think that the people that live in Tor haven't read the main papers and it probably is the biggest flaw in the, in the novel. But I needed her to go somewhere where everybody wasn't talking about Joss Moody. Um, so that was quite a, a practical problem. I needed Millie to be somewhere remote. And so I, I brought her back to Scotland, but I also wanted to bring her somewhere where she felt safe because she'd come to Tor for her family holidays since she'd been a girl. And she first took Joss there. And it kind of reminded me of different places that we went to in family holidays, that way that you, if you haven't seen it, the place for a year, the kind of the things that are, that are almost like time capsules. And you come back to find yourself a year ago in the form of whatever, <laughs> a shell or a pebble that you found in the beach. And I wanted a place where she could actually be almost looking at the museum of me, you know, and the, the archive of herself that she could be thinking because she also loses a sense of herself when Joss dies and people often lose or question who they are when they lose a loved one either because they've died or because they've broken up. You often then have to look at yourself in quite a deep way and say, who am I if I'm not this person's love? What does my life really mean? And she's doing that in this place. So I had to have her just in a wee cottage with a log fire and very little else. The woman sitting quietly in Mr Sharif's office had come on time with all the correct documents, with even more documents than she actually needed. She had a birth certificate for the deceased bearing the name Josephine Moore, a medical card for the deceased that is 52 years out of date under the name of Josephine Moore, registered with one Dr Miller in Greenock, Scotland. No pension book, three rather lucrative insurance policies, a marriage certificate for the deceased bearing the name Joss Moody. It was all fascinating stuff for Nasser Sharif. She didn't say a word. She handed the documents over. Mr Sharif looked up at her from behind his half-moon spectacles. He couldn't read her face. He couldn't tell if she was embarrassed or not. She looked just like a widow to him. She had the widow's sad skin. A widow who'd come to get the piece of paper that would tell her, because she still didn't believe it, that her husband had really died. I remember when I got to certain characters, like Albert Holding, who's the undertaker, I wrote that character, completely made him up, uh, and I had intended to go then afterwards to undertakers, you know, traipse myself about the place, and ask to interview them, to find out how accurate Albert Holding was. But I didn't do that in the end because to me he felt fictionally real. 
And to me, there's a difference between somebody feeling fictionally real and being actually real. And interestingly, the least successful character in Trumpet is Sophie Stones, a journalist. And that's because she's almost too close to what a reality would be as a journalist. So I couldn't find a way of breathing enough fictional life into her for her to have a life in the reader's mind. And it often fascinates me. It's a real conundrum. But Albert Holding, The Undertaker, I think is perfectly believable. And I didn't want to kind of get too bogged down in, in, the, in things. And the same with Mohammed Nasser Sharif, I think as a registrar, he's perfectly believable. So I didn't go out and interview lots of registrars. But I did take lots of things that I've learned in my life from various different jobs. Uh, and they actually helped me create some of these characters. Like, you know, I worked in as a hospital porter, I cleaned a mortuary. And I was a porter in 1981, uh, Brixton was burning, I was in London, there was a lot of terrible racism. And I would go to take somebody who was dying of cancer, whose skin was bright yellow from the jaundice that you get for late life cancer. I would go to pick them up to take them to radiology and they say, I'm not having her, get me somebody white. And uh, and I think, oh my God, you know, um, I, didn't, I didn't think that racism would still be in you as you were dying. I don't know why I just thought that. I just didn't think it. And I found it profoundly upsetting, not really for me, but for the person. I found it upsetting that for that dying person, that they should be going to death with the toxicity and the poison of racism still in them and would refuse me. And I had loads of experiences like that as a hospital porter. So there was that on the one hand, um, which made me think very deeply about racism and what it is. And then on the other hand, there was the experience of actually kind of cleaning a mortuary um, with a kind of mop. And one time I was in the mortuary and somebody said to me that when we bring bodies in, they can actually, even dead, sit straight up and burp because the body's still releasing gases and then lie back down again. And so I remember one day I was just in there on my own and you know, you know that everyone's in their shelves and stuff. <laughs> and it's kind of, you know, it's, it's, it was frightening to me at the time. Um, and I was kind of mopping away in the floor and then I was quite sure that I heard this and, um, and so I went kind of rushing out. <laughs> but, but, but I'm quite prone to being imaginative, so I don't know if that was me or if that was them. But um, I think, you know, being there for somebody when they're dying is the most intimate thing that you can do and it says such a lot about your relationship and Millie understands that her husband doesn't want to see a doctor and that he's phobic about doctors because doctors would discover that when he was born he was a girl and he doesn't want that compromised and that's more important to him than dying. He's quite prepared to die but he's not prepared to have to change um, his identity. The trip shakes him up. It's painful, but there is nothing like that pain. That pain is the sweetest, most beautiful pain in the world. Better than sex, soar or shuffle along, wing or glide, trudge or gallop, kicking out, mugging heavy, light, licking, breaking, screwballing out of this world. He could be the fourth horseman, the messenger, the sender. He could be the ferryman, the migrant, the dispossessed. He can't stop himself changing, running changes, changes running. He is changing all the time. It all falls off. Bandages, braces, cufflinks, watches, hair grease, suits, buttons, ties. He is himself again. Years ago, skipping along the railway line with a long cord his mother had made into a rope in a red dress. It is liberating to be a girl, to be a man. I think that jazz music of all music is the most fluid. And it seemed to me that to create a jazz musician would also be a way of writing about that kind of fluidity, not just gender fluidity, but all kinds of um, the way that music itself changes from, from the blues into jazz and, and on and I wanted to write about that that you know Joss is, Joss is born Josephine Moore um, he doesn't have lots of things available to him then that would be available to people now so he doesn't actually um, 
transform himself into a man, but he does believe himself to be a man and is is kind of horrified at the idea of 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 his girlhood and hides his his past and and kind of liberates himself and people often say did, to me did he do this because he wanted to play the trumpet he wanted to be a jazz musician and there weren't many jazz women trumpet players and but i don't think that's the answer and i kind of tend to resist answering questions that reduce um, people's identity because I think when we ask complex questions of our characters we keep on asking these questions and that's what keeps them alive but if you just say oh Joss Moody did this because he wanted to do that then that's so reductive um, explanations about things are reductive generally that, that there's no life in them so I like the, that the mystery is still there if you like and there's lots of questions that you still have to ask and I would never attempt to answer these questions myself. I write in order to ask questions, not to answer them.